Hello, precious YouTube family. Hope you all got. Hope you all are being blessed. Um, as I was saying in the last video, I want to continue the teachings on purgatory, but I'm going to be using uh, the videos from Still Small Voice and Heart Dwellers uh, <coughs> to um, um, share with you guys uh, what exactly is purgatory, what did the early church believe, and even what did the Jews believe at that time, and these. Teachings are coming from um, Mother Claire and Nega, who's the uh, leader of Heart Dwellers and Still Small Voice. So I'm going to be sharing with you guys the topic of purgatory from her perspective. And I want to say, purgatory is very, very real. It is not just a made-up Catholic fantasy, but it is something that is very real and that is very... Um, uh, Merciful, because it's God's mercy, um, and it's this amazing uh, grace and merciful uh, act that the Lord has given us, that even the souls who are not prepared for death can receive God's mercy at the last minute. Ask yourself, what if a soul lived all their life in sin, and at the last moment of their lives they decided to receive Jesus Christ, but they still had patterns of sin in their life that they could not conquer? Would the Lord just send them to hell because they could not conquer their sins? Or would Jesus have mercy on them and, and send them to purgatory, a place where they can be purified and repent of their sins, see the damages that, that their sins have caused to themselves, to others, and to their relationship with God, and be truly sorry and want to commit these things no more? So if you were, so if you were a soul, all right? And you lived all your life, you know, in, let's say, um, prostitution, or maybe uh, smoking or drinking or alcoholism, or maybe you took advantage of others and stole from people during your whole life. And at the last moment of your life, even on your deathbed, you decided to receive the Lord, but you still had um, patterns of sin that you had in your life that were so um, uh, hard to conquer because of, you know, they were a part of you your whole life. Now, would God, in his loving mercy, send you to hell because you cannot conquer those sins? Or, He, in His infinite would he in his infinite wisdom give you a chance to make retribution for the, I mean, restitution for those sins, reparation? Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ's blood washes away our sins. And yes, his blood does atone for our sins, and we are saved by the passion of Jesus. But we still have to make reparation for our sins because there are damages that are caused by our sins. For example, let's say you stole from someone, or let's say you spread lies or slander about them, things that, you know, that are not true. You've damaged that person's reputation all their life. And that person suddenly finds out, and now your relationship is damaged. He no longer, he or she no longer trusts you or wants to be around you. That's the damage that has been caused by your sin. Now, you can ask that person to forgive you. And maybe they will forgive you if they have a sensitive heart and a well-formed conscience, according to the Lord's, you know, ways. But the damage and hurt is still there. They still have that pain in their hearts and are more reluctant to trust you now because of what you've done to them. So what would you do to make it up to them? You would either buy them a gift or you would say you're sorry or you would go back and and redo, undo all the lies that you've done, um, all the lies that you've told and tell the truth about them, right? That is what we call reparation. And it is the same thing with the Lord. That are dam that are damages. There are damages that have been done by our sins, whether whether it's to our own soul, or to others, or to our relationship with the Lord. And reparation must be made. This is where purgatory comes in. And the souls who suffer in purgatory are making reparation to God's justice for their sins. God is loving and merciful, but God is also a God of justice, and God does not 
tolerate sin, although he is patient and loving and kind with all of us. Still, the actions we do have consequences. Consequences. The blood of Jesus washes away all of our sins, but that does not mean that the damage has been undone. There are still things that we can do to make reparation to God and to others for our sins and to show true repentance. Even as John the Baptist said, prove your repentance by fruit, by your good fruit. In other words, show that you are serious and are willing to follow God and have a change of heart by your good deeds and by your penance. Amen. So I'm going to share with you um, Mother Claire's message about the teachings of the early fathers, the early church, the church Jesus instituted on the rock of Peter himself that the gates of hell will not prevail against. And also what the Jews even believed about purgatory and praying for those who are dead. Just so you know, don't confuse this with necromancy. Praying for the dead and actually praying to the dead, you know, are two different things. It's those who are spiritually dead are those who are in hell, whereas the souls in heaven and those souls in purgatory are those who are alive. Because Jesus says, everyone who believes in me will never die. And if he does die, he will still live. So those who are in purgatory and in heaven are not dead, but they are fully alive, even as Jesus himself is alive. But let us begin. Mother Claire begins. Lord, this has been a then this has been such a dark and controversial subject. And now you have spoken words of advice and encouragement for those of us who were not taught what the first apostles believed. Dear Lord, help us repent today and not put off our conversion any longer. Amen. And when I talk about repenting today, I'm not talking just about salvation. I'm talking about the things that we still do that we know we shouldn't be doing. My dearest family, the Lord has asked me to share the traditions of the Jews and the early Christians and some of the current day liturgical churches. The practice of praying for the dead. For the dead. And here's another place where we've been ripped off by people starting their own churches and redoing doctrine and deciding to leave things out because it didn't suit their agenda. This is not about becoming Catholic. This is about becoming authentically first century Christians. Christians according to the teachings of the Apostolic Fathers. Teachings according to those who canonized the scriptures. These are the earliest teachers closest to the Lord. And for that reason, we're going back into Jewish, Jewish tradition as well. When I was evangelical, still this is Mother Claire speaking. When I was evangelical, I was always wondering, how does one get to heaven when they have lived a life of sin and convert only in the last moments? It's just like the, the picture I painted earlier for you guys. I understand that Jesus paid the price to redeem us and opened the, the gates of heaven by his death on the cross. But how does a man or a woman with a long life habit and pattern of sin act when they get to heaven? I mean, these are things that are ingrained. Your reactions are ingrained in your personality. And it takes time to turn those things around. How do you do it? It is just a grace that you get in the twinkling of an, of an eye. And you don't have to worry about it anymore. You're perfect now. Or is there more to it than that? Is will involved? Applying yourself? Is that involved? So true. The Lord Jesus paid the price for our sins. They are under the blood the ones we've confessed, but we still have a tendency towards sin. And in order to get rid of that tendency, there must be something the Lord can do for us before we get to heaven and are embarrassed by our thoughts because everyone in heaven can read your thoughts. 
So, it made complete sense to me when I first heard about purgatory, because the Lord said, Make every effort to reconcile with your adversary while you are on your way to the magistrate. Thinking and looking at the magistrate as the Lord himself in the courts of heaven. Otherwise, he may drag you off to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and the officer may throw you into prison. I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the very last penny. penny. And that's Luke chapter 12, verses 58 through 59, and the Lord speaking. While this scripture is not explicitly talking about the last judgment, it certainly causes us to pause and consider that we will stand before a righteous God. And if we have not repented of certain sins, there will be consequences. Another place in scripture that talks about purifying fires is where Paul says, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For today we will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. As 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. Wow, that's a very, very, very strong statement. For the purifying fires that take place between earth and heaven or our final abode in heaven. These scriptures point to a refining fire before the judge of heaven and earth, not the fires of hell, which are reserved for Satan and his demons, and those who consult with demons, but the fires of purification, where our works and motives are weighed in the balance to see if they are built on truth. In other words, you could be a wonderful teacher or a preacher, but if you're doing it to make money, or to receive a claim and be famous, if you're doing it for that motive, if any earthly thing is a motive for you preaching the gospel, it's going to be burned in the fire. <coughs> the words will never be burned. The Lord's words don't go forth without being fulfilled. So the purity of the word will go forth, but your motives will cause that to be burnt up as far as what is coming to you for the service that you rendered the Lord on earth. I continue to go back to the early church and what the first apostles believed, as well as the Jews upon whose faith the Lord continued to build. It is really interesting the way the Jews look at things, and I'm going to read some quotes to you. Some of them came from Wikipedia and some of them came from the douay Rheims Bible and from the church fathers like Tertullian. So the Lord began this morning by saying, Praying for the dead was never disputed in the early church. Wow, what a statement. Praying for the dead was never disputed in the early church. So what happened? After he said that, I looked up the church's father, the church father's teaching during the first five centuries after Christ. The evidence is overwhelming that prayers were offered for the dead. One of the scriptural proofs was in the book of Maccabees which was removed from the canon, meaning the Protestant Bible took it out. Second Maccabees 12, verse 46 from the douay Rims Bible, the 1899 American edition states, It is therefore a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from sins. Now, we could argue that that was before the Lord died on the cross and rose from the dead. That was before the complete forgiveness of sin. But still, there are repercussions for our sins. And the repercussions themselves have to be worked out. Here's what I found. Prayer for the dead is well documented within early Christianity. 
both among prominent church fathers and the Christian community in general. In Eastern Orthodoxy, Christians pray for soul for such souls that have um, Christians pray for such souls as have departed with faith, but without having had time to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. What did John the Baptist say? Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, prove your repentance by your changed life. Among church writers such as Tertullian, um, and he is a giant, an absolute giant as far as the church fathers go, and was so faithful during so many times of heresies that were floating around, and he was persecuted for it as well. Among the church writers, Tertullian is the first to mention prayers for the dead. The widow who does not pray for her dead husband is, has as good as divorced him. This passage, this passage occurs in one of his later writings, dating from the beginning of the 3rd century. Sorry guys, a lot of this information is going to be coming from um, early church fathers and early Jewish uh, teachings that you probably have never heard about. But I'm going to continue. It says, Subsequent writers similarly make mention of the practice as pre prevalent, not as unlawful or even disputed until Arius challenged it toward the end of the 4th century. You've probably heard the name Arius from the 4th century as being a uh, schismatic and a heretic when he was. He did not believe in the Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He didn't believe in the Trinity. He did not believe that Jesus was God. He said that Jesus had a beginning to his life and therefore he was not God. So this caused a serious division in Constantine's reign. The most famous instance is St. Augustine's prayer for his deceased mother, Monica, at the end of the ninth book of his confessions, written around 398 AD. And of course, Augustine is also one of the church fathers and had quite a um, quite an amazing conversion from what he was living in Rome. The article goes on to say, an important element in the Christian liturgies, both East and West, consisted of a um, list of names of living and dead commemorated at the Lord's Supper. So, for example, whenever the, whenever the Jews um, or, the, or faithful Jewish Christians came together, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, they had a list of names of those who were living and or dead. To be inserted in these lists was a confirmation of one's orthodoxy, and out of the practice grew the official canonization of saints. And and because of those things, because of like these, this is how we get the canonization of certain saints, um, such as Saint Therese, Saint Augustine, Saint John Vianney, Saint Padre Pio. Or it says, on the other hand, removal of a name was a condemnation. So there were a list of people that were prayed for at Mass or at the Lord's Supper. So people who were dead, um, when, when the living came together to celebrate the Holy Mass or the Lord's Supper, those who were dead were actually prayed for by those who were living. And some of them had gone on to be with the Lord. Um, although it is not possible as a rule to name dates for the exact words used in the ancient liturgies, yet the universal occurrence of these um, list of names and of definite prayers for the dead in all parts of the Christian church, east and west, in the 4th and 5th fifth, fifth centuries, show how primitive such prayers were. The language used in the prayers for the departed is asking for rest and freedom from pain and sorrow. So basically, they were praying for those who pass from this world that they may receive eternal rest and also go on and be with the Lord and be free from pain and sorrow. So obviously they are not in heaven or there would be no pain and sorrow. A passage from the liturgy of St. James, the Lord's brother, composed in the 4th century reads, Remember, O Lord, the God of spirits and of all flesh, those whom we have remembered and those whom we have not remembered, men of the true faith, from righteous April unto day, do thou thyself give them rest there in the land of the living, in thy kingdom, in the delight of paradise, in the bosom of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our holy fathers, 
from whence pain and sorrow and sighing have fled away, where the light of thy countenance visiteth them and always shineth upon them. And I guess this this is the King James Version. So it's obvious that it wasn't wasn't just taken as just automatically you would go straight to heaven when you died, unless you were martyred. That is the teaching. Public prayers were only offered for those who were believed to have died as faithful members of the church. But St. Perpetua, who was martyred in 202 AD, believed herself to have been encouraged in a vision to pray for her brother, who had died in his eighth year, almost certainly unbaptized. And a later vision assured her that her prayer was answered and he had been translated from punishment, meaning he was in purgatory, and through her prayers, the Lord granted mercy on his soul, and he was taken up into heaven. Eastern and Oriental Orthodox believe in the possibility of situation change for the souls of the dead through the prayers of the living, and reject the term purgatory. Prayer for the dead is encouraged in the belief that it is helpful for them, although how the prayers of the faithful help departed, although how the prayers of the faithful help the departed is not elucidated. Eastern Orthodox simply believe that tradition teaches that prayers should be made for the dead. St. Basil the Great, who was a bishop, writes in his third kneeling prayer at Pentecost, O Christ, our God, on this all-perfect and saving feast, art graciously pleased to accept propitiatory prayers for those who lay imprisoned in Hades, promising unto us, or held in bondage great hope of release from the vileness that doth hinder us and did hinder them. Send down thy consolation, and establish their souls in the mansions of the just, and graciously vouchsafe unto them peace and pardon. For not, for not the dead shall praise thee, O Lord. Neither shall they who are in hell make bold to offer unto thee confession. But we who are living will bless thee, and will pray and offer unto thee propitiatory prayers and sacrifices for their souls. Now, he's not praying for the souls in hell, because the souls in hell have no mercy for them. Rather, he's praying for the souls who are in prison. Even as St. Peter says that Jesus, after he was, after his soul descended into limbo, he went to minister to the spirits in prison. St. Gregory, in his famous dialogues, teaches that the holy sacrifice, which is the Eucharist of Christ, or the Lord's Supper, our saving victim, brings great benefits to souls even after death, provided their sins are such as can be pardoned in the life to come. However, St. Gregory goes on to say the church's practice of prayer for the dead must not be an excuse for not living a godly life on earth. In the West, there is ample evidence of the custom of praying for the dead in the inscriptions of the catacombs. And this is the catacombs, or a tremendously reliable source of the early practice of the Christians. They have the Lord's Supper, women celebrating the Lord's Supper in the catacombs, and they have the list of names, the list of the people to be prayed for at Mass, or the Lord's Supper. Anyway, the custom of praying for the dead in the inscriptions of the catacombs, with their constant prayers for the peace and refreshment of the souls of the departed in the early liturgies, which commonly contain commemorations for the dead in Tertullian, Cyprian, and, o and other Western fathers, witness to the regular practice of praying for the dead among the early Christians. And that is the end of part one, guys. And this is going to be a three-part series because it is a lot. So God bless you guys, and thank you all for this, for listening to this message. It was a lot. I hope it didn't confuse you all. But basically the gist of it is that there is evidence in the early church and in the Jewish uh, traditions in the time of Jesus Christ and after his death that there is evidence of praying for those um, who left this world. Not for those who are in hell because their judgment is sealed. But those who are in purgatory or the spirits in prison or who are receiving purification, um, the Lord still is purifying them from their sins. And prayers can be made on their behalf so that they can uh, finally be at rest and go and be with the Lord for eternity. Because whether we die spiritually, 
whether we end up in hell or heaven, our souls are eternal, and we will we will um, stand before the Lord because our souls were made for Him alone, and only He can fill our souls. And may the Lord bless all of you, precious heart dwellers, and I'll be and I'll be with you in the next message.